welcome back to number 14. You know, I never actually thought that I would get to number 14 because considering I have a, a weird thing about, um, you know, when it comes to commitment, but I think this is some, I think the you guys' response and you, the way you guys go about this and some of the stuff you guys said about what Dami said, again, it's crazy. I do want to say like, he does say very, very thank you. And his dad being what he is says thank you to you guys as well. But, and like I said in the last podcast, you guys can really relate to what he said, but you can also relate to like the way he said stuff because he talks so highly about necessarily his parents and stuff like that. So yeah, he does say thank you. And so does his dad. But more importantly, it's somebody that um, has been kindly enough to reschedule with me and reschedule and reschedule because she's really busy, which is so impressive, to be honest with you. Um, it's, and sorry if you can also hear my dogs in the background, guys. She's going crazy tonight. I don't I think it's the heat. But tonight's guest is someone that has worked for Bauer Media, but has actually gone and left her dream job and become self-employed. And it's admirable to go from a paycheck to working for yourself. It shows you trust your work that will pay for your bills and many more. Her guest, her name, sorry, is Fiona Gray. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. And yeah, I want to thank you again for like, you know, rescheduling. Unfortunately, you know, you're busy, but and a lot of people would be um, frustrated. But as I said on my last podcast, I was like, I get impressed when someone's like, oh, I'm, I've got a lot of work to do and stuff because... One, it proves they're actually working hard versus, you know, sitting around, which unfortunately a lot of us do. But then it proves that, like, you know, they, they have the respect to then reschedule versus, like, pushing it for some reason. But I, and this podcast, I, I wanted to make it a little bit differently because, as I said to you, I do admire yourself, the fact that you went for working for Bauer Media and your dream job to then go and self-employed. So how, how, how does it feel? How do you feel today doing that? Yeah, I think at the time, um, so it was a huge, I was at Bower for eight years, so it was mm. a huge decision. You know, I'd, I'd left uni and pretty much gone straight to Bower, um, based in Edinburgh, working across the whole country, and then promoted to working across the whole group, and then just kind of promoted within the, the video department that I was in. Mm. So it was a huge burden on me thinking, do I want to, do I not? You know, there's pros and cons for going freelance and you know, one of them, one of the one of the pros is that you sort of have more control over your own work. But then one of the cons is you also don't have as much control over your paycheck and your holidays and your sick pay and things. So it was a huge worry for me for a long time. And then when I finally bit the bullet and did it, it was a mix of excitement and, and excitement of the unknown, but then also pure terror because I was also <laughs> unknown. <laughs> So it was really conflicting, but also, you know, it it was ex the excitement was good. Even the fear was good because if I was too comfortable with it, then it would just be silly. Like I, it, you need the fear to kind of drive you a bit more. So yeah, do you use do you use um, being uncomfortable? Because a lot of people, you kind of did just answer this, but a lot of people use this being uncomfortable as a bad thing. But I think if you're putting yourself in, um, in uncomfortable positions, that's actually a really good thing because it proves you're trying to improve. Would you say you're the same as well? The fact that you're wanting to put yourself in a uncomfortable, what you said was uncomfortable position. Do you feel like it's actually improved you better in everything, not just necessarily work, but everything in life? Yeah, I think I, I'm a firm believer in you don't grow in your comfort zone. You know, it's so easy to sit and just fumble along and plod plod away and, and and that's fine for some people but if you want to grow and you want to progress and you want to make your way up whatever career ladder that you've decided then I definitely think you need to step out of your comfort zone not set necessarily into a terrifying way but just into like a one that's maybe not as comfortable as the other places so you learn new skills you adapt to situations and it's the change that makes you grow so yeah I, I would I would say that I put myself in horribly uncomfortable positions all the time to try and grow myself that's a good thing though does that come from like um did you learn that yours because did you learn that yourself or is that come from like you know have you learned that from your parents or if there's just somebody else that's kind of moved you to be like that or is it just like just you well so when I was young, I was I was a swimmer. Um, I was wow. on the Scotland squad, Scotland youth squad, and trained crazy times, and I adapted my schoolwork and changed subjects and stuff to fit around my swimming schedule. So, obviously, when you're training, you're really uncomfortable. You know, you're you're sweating, you're sore, you're 
exhausted from the amount of times you're in and out the pool and doing land sessions and stuff so I mean the only way to get better is to sort of tire yourself out and the only way to grow muscle is to break the muscle to rebuild it again so probably from sport I would say that I learned how to do that and I've probably just subconsciously carried it through into my adult and career as well adult life yeah was swimming always something that you wanted to pursue or was there was your parents like you should be a swimmer or was it just like no I definitely want to do it well my brother my big brother is a few years older than me and he joined the swimming club and I also thought that was really cool so I thought well I want to do it as well and it's quite funny because a lot there's a lot of pushy parents you see in sport Mm -hmm. um but my mum and dad were amazing they never pushed me once everything I did was me going to training sessions me choosing to do these camps and runs and whatever I was doing it was always me they never pushed me and it's something that I've always really admired with them they've never forced me to do anything I want Mm. that's the same with me I am I competed in taekwondo for Scotland quite a few times and uh, my mom my mom was I was just as I told you before the podcast started I was just brought by my amazing mom shout out to her and uh, she brought but she always always like if you don't ever want to do it you genuinely don't have to but then it was the parents that you've seen from like even from like um from everywhere there was not even one there was not one country that didn't come over or even in this country Scotland and England that the parents weren't like extremely pushy for their kids to be good but you've seen that reflecting in their the way they done stuff they weren't able to hold themselves properly because they're always looking behind them and it does it does come a distraction but yeah it makes it a choice it makes it if, if you're not forced into it then it's a choice to to continue and better and you know if you're choosing to do something then the outcome's usually going to be hopefully better than being forced into it yeah yeah I think it I think it comes down to a personal thing it like it takes a lot of like motivation to do it even for a lot of people to even get up in the morning so the fact that you know what you want to do is 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 you know is an admirable skill but I do want to ask you have you always known what you wanted to do like have you always known you wanted to be in media or was it just that did you kind of just happen to jump into the job oh my god no not at all so I went to Stirling Uni um and I originally like I said did sports I originally went there because of the sports programs they they had an amazing pool amazing swimming programs and I started off doing sports studies and part of that sports studies there's sports science modules and I quickly realized that I am not scientific academically (laughs) at all and Sterling's quite good in the sense of you take lots of different modules in your first couple of years and it really because it kind of broadens your knowledge and education and just kind of gives you a bit of variety and then you start to focus down on your degree but luckily if you start to do that you can switch degrees quite easily so I did subjects in like medieval history I did lots of um sort of sociology psychology in my first couple of modules and then I picked up a few film modules so it was I think it was um European cinema and um global cinema and there was other ones like classic Hollywood narrative and I actually just thought you know that's quite fun I'm really enjoying it and it was a really I know some people think media is maybe, oh, that's a bit of an easy degree, but it was like English, but with film. So we wrote essays and essays and critiqued things and just like you would books, but on films. And so I swapped my degree. Um, I took enough media degree uh, modules to then swap my degree. So I kind of fell into it just through Sterling showing me that I actually really was really interested in sort of the theory behind films and how how they come about and the history of them and things so yeah no I I never thought I would get into this and I remember my my papa when I told him I was switching degrees he he, he was like no that's that's bad there won't be anything in the media for you you know you should stick stick to sport stick to sport and obviously media is huge like it maybe wouldn't have been in his you know sort of childhood and in early earlier life but it's huge now so there's so much more potential and avenues that you can go down in media so I just thought it was the right choice for me so that's kind of how I got into it yeah yeah I think it's I think I think the the you you know you were able to identify it because not all like for for example from myself and being 
so 23 so three years ago now when i was 23 ish 20 slash 20 in fact it would have been actually about now when I, I actually decided i was like you know i want to be in media then that was like when i officially decided but you decided back in uni so i mean for yourself that's that's impressive and i just I, w- I want to say as well i didn't actually realize that you stayed in scotland i didn't i didn't know, I know. That. before you kept telling me where places were like how oh, hamilton's near glasgow I'm like yeah no i know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we, we had a conversation about something and uh, i was like oh yeah I'm sitting naming places and then I thought about it and I was like, wait a minute, isn't she from Edinburgh? <laughs> Sorry. I'm Edinburgh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's a, the thing about Scotland is, you know, to come off that, right? And you'll be able to relate to that is that people think there isn't a lot for media in Scotland. The amount of people yeah. I've spoken to, especially um, whether it been, you know, at the gym or whether it been um, at my kind of job thing that I was meant to start and uh, the, the where, it, and it, you know, where it even being like the, you know speaking to people in the shops they're like oh there's literally no jobs in scotland or england for media i'm like you do know that like the majority of like media jobs are roughly probably in the uk you just genuinely don't hear about them because we don't really blast about them as much as what other people do but was there ever a point where you were doing your degree and you're finished and obviously you're getting along and you're like i actually wonder if this doesn't work out what was was did you ever have that point or have you always been like this will definitely work out no, I am very good at sort of, I love I love to plan and I love to organise, but I'm also quite good at just rolling with things and seeing where they go. Um, but I remember I, during uni, so I'd had lots of student jobs as you do when you're a student. So I worked at like Blair Drum and Safari Park. I worked at Domino's Pizza. I worked in bars and shops. And I remember when I was at Domino's, it was the last student job I had. And I'd been for, I thought originally I wanted to get into TV. Mm. Um, and so I'd been for loads of job interviews, done loads of running jobs for like Channel 4 and things. And I'd got offered uh, an interview. I got down to the last four with BBC One. It was like their apprenticeship scheme. And right, um, yeah. so Radio One, I went down and I just remember I didn't get it. I was one of the last ones down and I didn't get it. And I just thought, what am I going to do? This is awful. And I just remember my mum saying to me, you know, what's for you won't go by you. And I thought, nah, nah. And then literally the week after I got my Bower job. So I didn't have to move to London. I got a permanent job. And yeah, there was there was moments that I thought, well, this is far too competitive for me. But then I think I kind of agree with my mum, you know, what's for you? I just think won't buy you. I think there's something out there for everyone and it will fall into place if you work for it and find the right connections and avenues. Yeah, I think what a lot of people don't realise as well is that, especially when I speak to like, um, well, I, I call her mum, I call her mom, she's mum's best friend, but I call her mum anyway, because I've known her since I was maybe like five or six or something like that. But when I speak to her kids and that, and they ask me about like, but they're like, they necessarily look at what you have now. And they're like, I'm like, yeah, but I didn't actually know what I wanted to do until three years ago when I was 23. I was like, you can go to school, study your subjects. One of them's actually um, going to be joining the army um, next year. But I was like, go to school, study your subjects. But at the end of the day, you could, you might, you might end up being, there is a slight chance you might be my age and still know what you do, not what you want to do, but that's perfectly fine. I mean, my, um, my auntie, my auntie Leslie's daughter. So I think, I, I don't know what you call that. Is that you? Is that, could, I think, could, I think. Is, I think I think so. I'm not sure. I usually just call her Victoria. I've never actually thought about that. But she didn't get qualified in business until she was 32. I think she qualified and she jumped into a job then. So like that's she just yeah. said the same thing. She wanted to have kids and have a family. She did live in like um, Qatar and that and was with some Qatari, you know, really really rich person. That's the way to put it. Yeah. But she she's now over here and then she's like completely changed. And that's she was one of the people that spoke to me after she found out that my brothers you know becoming a nurse and stuff and she was like so what are you going to do with yourself and I was sitting there like I actually don't know but mm-hmm. I love helping people making content being like a mentor being able to put people in positions mm-hmm. with no reward just genuinely be able to put people in touch with people and she's like why don't you jump into media see how far you can get then and then you'll probably have more control to be able to put people in positions but I think that um a question I am curious to ask yourself is that you did you, how how does it like um how does it feel to be in control of your own finances and the way you deal with, I don't want to know money-wise, just in general, versus, um, you know, for example, Bauer paying your bills. How does it know that you have to then pay your own bills? How does that, how does that feel? 
I mean, it is scary. Um, luckily, I have, through word of mouth and through various networking and connections, have been okay this first sort of few months. Um, but it's scary you kind of look at things. And, and what I found very comforting about being in a nine-to-five job employee mm. was that I could look at the calendar and be like, cool, 10 days till I get paid. And then I'd transfer it and pay off my bills and things like that. And now because it's more about when clients pay you, Mm. some of their late so you have to chase people they all come in at different times because you do different jobs at different times so I think it's a wee bit more sporadic and I think I need to just start getting used to it because this is still new to me you know mm. like I say yeah. I, I, I was there for years so it's still really fresh to me um but I'm kind of what I'm really enjoying is that the work I'm doing because because I would get paid exactly the same every month regardless of what I was doing so I could work my butt off for days and days and days and days and days for hours and still get paid the same whereas when you're freelance if you do that you gain the the revenue from it yourself instead of making it for a company um but then it also worked in the other way as well you know I could do nothing not that I did if anyone's listening I could do (laughs) nothing for a month and then still get paid the same so I am enjoying that the hard work I'm putting into it is then returned to me through either either more work or financial benefit and stuff so it has its pros and cons Mm. just like just like all of freelancing versus employed life does yeah yeah I think again I think it comes down to like I was saying before, you obviously trust your work will pay your bills because that's what I think a lot of people that, you know, I know some, I know some not to name any names because that's genuinely not fair and I wouldn't, but I know some people that have left their jobs, but their work is not up to par and they know that, but they've left their jobs and now they're like, it's not paying my bills and then they can't get the job back again. But the fact that you knew, you were that confident that your work, you knew your work could pay. There's, I think there's a, there does come a sense of like um was sorry was there a sense of moment where you like you were like you know what I could go freelance now because you were this year I mean what 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 made you not want to do it last year or the year before what was it what was so special about 2021? I think I think the pandemic's actually been quite an eye-opener for a lot of people in a lot of different ways I feel like I was talking to a couple lawyers and they were like divorce is on the rise Mm -hmm. so even people assessing like their marriage or assessing their careers or their houses you know lots of people are moving house now because they're like nah I've done so long in this I'm I'm out kind of thing I want something new so I feel like that's kind of what I did you know I was just assessing it um and I always want to do more and more but because I'd been there for so long it was very samey what I was doing you know there were so many people that would say to me oh my god your job must be so varied and it was to an extent but it also had a lot of repetition that people wouldn't have seen unless you're in that job Mm. so I was kind of feeling like I was lacking a bit of creative flair and I was getting quite down about it and And I am what you said earlier, I'm the same. I love making content. I love making, um, you know, something that makes people smile. So I feel like my content doesn't have to be beautifully perfect and, you know, really flash and dreamy footage. It can be really rough in in just a good piece of content. I don't think a good piece of content necessarily equates to filmed very well or edited very well. I think it's what you've captured and how you've captured it so you know I I do vlogging um just for my YouTube but I have done it for I've done some for the BBC I have done some for clients and I like I've 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 won a trip around the world making vlog content for a company who wanted me to go and just eat food and travel around wherever I wanted so I went around Asia um yeah that was amazing and so like none of them are really posh and fancy videos you know you see adverts and stuff on tv yeah they're they're made by big production companies that are amazing and look so incredible but that's not the kind of content I was into and I just feel like when I was kind of in my role I wasn't quite 
getting to do the stuff that I wanted to do mm. and so just I was just chatting with my fiance one day and we, we obviously spoke about it for years and years and years and then one day he was like just do it like just do it we can we can do it and yeah and so I just bit the bullet and decided to hand him my notice which was terrifying but <laughs> so exciting I think that um you know as you, you were saying about the trip the trip around the world that's that's amazing how did how how, how on earth did you manage to j- jump into that type of thing how did how on earth did that come about <laughs> So again, again, it was me, I felt stuck. I felt like, you know, I was in the same job. I wasn't really getting to make the creative stuff I wanted to. And, you know, my bosses and stuff all knew this, but that was the role I was in. Um, So I just decided one day years ago, maybe 2017, Mm -hmm. that I was was going on a trip to Germany and I just thought, you know what, I'm going to make a video diary of this because what's the harm and I showed it to one of my friends and she was like oh my god you have to share this so then I shared it and it got loads of good feedback so I thought oh maybe I'll make more and then it just kind of progressed it went more and more and more and yeah and then I saw a flyer or a poster I can't remember what I saw but it was like do you want to win all this money and win this adventure like to go traveling and kit and stuff for us and I thought well that's that sounds fun so I messaged one of my um video friends and I said do you want to come on an adventure with me and be my sort of second camera person and he was like absolutely so we went up to Cullen um, Mm. in Murrayshire and we were so you had to film something about travel and food so I was like right I want to go make Cullen skink in Cullen so we um we went up there we stayed in Wigwam and we just filmed the adventure which was really fun and then it was quite funny because he had had a really bad day at work and the I got a message pop up on my Facebook from it said Pierre something and I was like oh my god who is this Mm -hmm. and it was like hi can we can we speak to you please and I was like who who is this (laughs) and I was like what what weirdo is messaging me and they gave me a number to call they asked me my number so no they gave me the number so I called the number Mm -hmm. and they were just saying look we're from whatever agency um just to let you know you've won this competition out of thousands of people (laughs) I was like I thought it was my friend pranking me and I was like very funny and they were like what's funny and I was like oh oh actually this is real so yeah I I was absolutely beside myself like I couldn't believe it so I took a sabbatical from work I my friend um is a travel agent so she just planned my whole trip for me she took my budget and where I wanted to go what the best foods were so I went to Japan Hong Kong Vietnam Cambodia Thailand um Singapore and Bali yeah so it was amazing it was amazing oh my god that's that that is amazing Bali I actually know one or two people that decided that they were going to completely move from this country like they saw I think they he sorry sold his car I think he actually got given his mum's old car, so he, but he kept that deliberately. So he sold that and then literally sold anything. The next thing he turns up in Bali in this house and he's like, it's like a whole amazing lifestyle over here. It's completely yeah. different, but yeah. that, that's incredible. Though. What would you say is the, the, um, the best place you went? And then if it's not the same place, what would you say was the best food you had? If it's, a diff- well, if it's the same place as well. But- oh, so I, I went obviously just kind of with myself um I, I met a tour group in Japan and I adored Japan and I made the best friends um and the food in Japan is obviously incredible mm. um it's hard because I loved Singapore like I felt so safe there it was so clean and fresh and it's so green everywhere and you just feel like you just breathe in so much oxygen and oh it was just lovely there and it's so strict and polite and nice um but then I hadn't seen my partner in months so we met in Bali like we he flew out to Bali to meet me so obviously I had a nice holiday with him as well um so yeah kind of a mix between Bali and Singapore for favorite place and Japan obviously for food um I got water poisoning (laughs) in in, uh, Malaysia well we we went jumping in a, a river and obviously 
swollen some river water and I was not well but I think it's kind of it was funny because it was kind of like a normal thing to talk about in like tour groups and stuff over there it was just like oh how are you feeling you're like oh I'm not great and they're like yeah no I wasn't great yesterday so yeah it was a and it was experience I think if I'd gone over to Asia and not gone got ill I would have been missing out on an experience so <laughs> yeah no I actually know a few people that went over to Thailand and went to um went to a certain island that begins with a P, but I always say it wrong and it's a really crude word on YouTube and Is I know what they're like. Phuket. Yeah, that's the one. You said Phuket. it right. I don't say it like that, so I say it wrong. They yeah. went over there and then um, they came back over again and it's the same type of thing. They sold literally everything and then I don't know what they do over there, to be honest with you, but all I know is that they're still over there. Some of them work in street stalls and stuff like that, but they're like, mm-hmm. it's just a better life. Thailand's it's, amazing. Thailand's I've never, amazing. Personally, never been. I want to go. I'm kind of like... um. It's, I'm not scared of heights, but me and my brother went to Bulgaria, and those of you who are listening, I'd listened to, I can't remember what podcast it was now, but there was one podcast that talked about this, but normally planes go up, for example, normally planes go up like that, nice and straight and everything's fine, so um, the, the, <laughs> the pilot walked on the plane when we were all on the plane, which was rather weird, because usually they're on before everybody and mm-hmm. stuff like that to thingy, so and, and clearly he was drunk, clearly. And uh, this was in 2012 when me, my, me and my brother went to Bulgaria before it was the hype. It was like 10p yeah. a pint and stuff like that. It was crazy. But um, or it was before that. I can't remember. It was a while ago. But anyway, we saw he comes on and he's like, you know, he's, he's talking to us, put his hands on his chair and then talking to these these women and stuff. And I'm like, this guy can't be seriously a pilot. Like he's completely away with it. So then he jumps in the plane and he's talking about us. He's like, it might be, he's, he's joking about it, maybe a bumpy ride and stuff. I think he was trying to copy the Harry Potter thing. And then all of a sudden the plane starts going like this and then it starts going sideways and like oh back God. and forth and stuff. I've never, and ever since then, that completely knocked. So we got to the, oh, it's not the fourth road bridge. You know the bridge and um, it's the railway bridge going from this side to Edinburgh. You know the, the red one? The fourth bridge. Fourth bridge, that's the one. Yeah. The fourth bridge. We were coming over that, and the plane dropped a hundred feet. Oh, and it, yeah, I've never. And then the wee boy, I was, I was going crazy. The wee boy in front of me turned around. He must have been about six years old, and was like, "Mate, it's fine. We're going to land." And I was sitting, I was sitting, saying to him, "I was like, yeah, but I'm terrified." In oh. other words, I was like, "Yeah, I'm terrified." And he was like, "No, no, you'll be all right. You'll be fine and stuff." I always remember that little, because he was well, a little, little boy. Yeah, he he'll be like sixteen or something now, but I'll always remember what he said and that. And, yeah, that's that's kind of knocked my 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 oh. lion and stuff like that. Now I just go down to, um, I've got family in um, Oxford, so I go down there quite a lot and spend a lot of time with my godson and stuff like that. Oh, nice. I, I can drive versus getting on a yeah, jump. You can drive plane. to Oxford. That's true. Well, yeah, I'm cu- I'm curious on like um on the the media side to get back to that. I think that that being in media, you 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 know, you seem really like switched on in that and you know for a fact that like right this is how it is this is so you need to constantly keep on your work does it come in like a a development stage of your work where you're like I don't know if even though it may be ready you're like I don't know if this is ready just yet and have you ever like um overworked so you've maybe done too much for one thing you're like well I've kind of ruined that so I've had to come back again and redo it type thing yeah I feel like because I was at Bower for so long I feel like I learned so much um you know that's something I'm so grateful for from being at that company the the everyone taught me different things so from practical skills to dealing with people to dealing with clients to dealing with sales execs counting revenue you know I learned so many good transferable skills from being at that company Mm -hmm. and I think one of the things you kind of learn over time with filming at least is how to I mean I always overshoot it, and most people do you know the worst thing is when you come back and you're like I have nothing to put into this edit so but I think you kind of edit in your head as you go along there's not a lot of just blind shooting unless it's like a massive event that you have no idea what's happening and you're just filming what happens live if it's if it's something that you are able to plan and able to sort of vision in your head envision in your head the the edit as you go along that kind of really reduces your sort of overworking slash underworking so I think it's something that you kind of pick up on and you know your work you know like the third take of that was the best one so you kind of come and you go right third take or that was the best and I 
yeah, I've learned kind of how to do it efficiently over over the years. So I wouldn't say I overwork the stuff too much. Yeah, I always find that like um, I, you know, when I, when I had my very first podcast was a uh, Marcus Nash. I never I never you know not talk positively about him because the fact that he literally came on before the artwork was even done I just messaged him and he was like yeah yeah I believe in you but that's because he started the social media for um Hamilton Football Club like it was they never had a football club so he had, he never had media so he started at work for three months and there was and he went they went look we want to pay you he never obviously said quite rightfully but he said they want to pay him x amount of money now versus you know, he worked free for three months and he said, I'll even work for six months if that's what it takes. And mm -hmm. So I'll always admire him. But something I did with his podcast the first to start is that I edited it a lot, like proper chopped it up and stuff like that. And then I, th I thought about it and a lot of people said, and they were like, look, the biggest podcast out there, arguably just now, two of them is Joe Rogan, as everybody knows, mm -hmm. and then Impulsive with like Jake Paul and Mike May Mike Mayak, I think that's what we call him, and George George Janko, I think his name is, and they don't edit it. So he was like, you, a lot of people are saying, you shouldn't edit your podcast. You should leave it naturally because people are going to feel like you're proper having a conversation versus chopping it out and stuff like that. And that was the moment that kind of clicked in my head, you know, that it, it, it does take in, you know, it does take a, a slight bit of like what you were saying, the rough cuts. People actually really like that People versus yeah. the unattainable stuff because again it makes people think like oh I could maybe create a podcast or I could maybe go on YouTube or something like that yeah but, it, it makes people human yeah. yeah yeah exactly yeah exactly I'm I'm curious as well is that what makes you like um what makes you stay so driven every single day like what's the obviously take away like um you know your bills and your fiance and your wee dog and stuff like that but what personally keeps you personally driven every day Oh God, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know what? I just like to do a good job. I, I just, I'm naturally just, I'm, I'm a big perfectionist, probably got ADHD that is undiagnosed. And I just, I like making things for people and I like helping people. So if I can help a client or if I can help, you know, someone with a video I just I just sat today and edited my brother and sister-in-law's wedding video that I just filmed for them for fun like I didn't actually tell them I was doing it I just did it wow. and so like if I can make someone's day or really help a client get their brand out there or you know helping you with the podcast that's kind of how I stay driven is helping people and and obviously the bills and the life that I need to live um yeah. but yeah I think take that away and and making people happy and helping is probably what keeps me driven yeah how does um how does your you know f how does your fiance feel about how you go and self-employed because obviously he will be really proud you took the step quite rightfully to be honest with you but is does he, well, obviously um, you might not know because I don't know if he's maybe told you but has he ever been like or oh, maybe you shouldn't do that or he's been has like you said before has he always been like no if that's what you has he because obviously you said you went to um thailand and vietnam and things like that and singapore and stuff so but then he flew out to see you so it seems like he's always been like your supporter is that what kind of like kept you guys together yeah he is honestly he's amazing he's like my biggest cheerleader um he you know if i see something and i'm like oh no i'm not good enough or oh no i'm not probably up to that job or things like that he is so supportive of everything I do and every choice I make so he god you're making me sound soppy here he, um, <laughs> he, he's great he he was the one that actually convinced me to do it and he was like we will get by we will find you work and if not you have transferable skills that any company would die for so he was like you know your career needs to move on and your skills need to move on so take the leap now before you know before you get too settled and decide you know it's not for you he was like if you don't do it now you'll never do it so he he is amazing he's great mm. yeah especially before like um you know you end up having you know and because that's what have can I say yeah because what was I can talk about the situation that's what I ended up having with my brother and his you know situation and that they were together for eight years and uh, that dissipated completely because they just didn't have that you know she was wanting him to 
you know, stay at home and have kids and stuff, which is perfectly cool. But my brother was like, wait, I just qualified to be a nurse. He competes in jujitsu and stuff. So he constantly travels around and he was like, I can't commit to you anymore because of that. But that's uh, the fact that you found somebody that, you know, is genuinely your biggest supporter. And at the end of the day, you always see the motivation things about, you know, what Bill Gates says and Jeff Bezos still talks about his wife, Michelle, mm-hmm. I think that's his name, her name, sorry, really, really highly because she's like, without that supporter, I wouldn't have been, even though Bill and Melinda are now separated or divorced or something, yeah. but he's she, the, he still talks highly and says, if, I, if it wasn't for her, I genuinely wouldn't have been able to progress to the next okay. level. So obviously you you found that and to this day we're on, you know, I think that you'll, you know, maybe in like five, 10 years time when you progress, he'll be like, see, I told you you could do it. That's yeah, he will, oh, 100% thing. shove it in the face, 100%. <laughs> you're those days you're like oh I don't know if I can and he's like well 10 years time or five years time you'll be like well I told you you could do it type thing so that's yeah. that's really impressive to be honest but yeah. has your um have you always now you've gone self-employed and obviously it's maybe a strange question to ask right now but have you or do you always necessarily want to work you know for yourself or have you always have you dreams of maybe like creating your own company and having people work with you or something like that or for you or is it just you know always going to be Fiona (sighs) unsure Mm -hmm. you know I still don't really know what I want to do when I grow up Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) so I think so I love presenting like I love vlogging so Mm -hmm. I one of the reasons I left was to do more stuff with me in front of camera so you know more vlogging more tv presenting if i get the opportunity i've been on the radio a few times with bauer um you know maybe some more shifts on the radio so i think my skills behind the camera i've obviously i've done them for so long and i love doing them but i wanted to see what i can do in front of camera as well so potentially growing towards there um and yeah, maybe just a mix. So potentially just working for myself and freelancing around. Um, but I'll never rule out working for a company. Um, and I'll never rule out, you know, growing into starting my own one and employing people. Because I think one of the things that you see now is that the working environment is so important. You know, you're, how, how flexible it is and how decent your company is and then the environment that you're put into the pressures put on you you know there was all that publicity about brew dog just you know not long ago mm. so i think i would love potentially maybe not but if i was going to create my own sort of company and employ people i'd want to create such a lovely atmosphere and a lovely environment for people to thrive and actually love their work and want to come in and not have sunday dreads so you know there's lots of avenues i could take i just haven't quite pinned down the one I want yet yeah I'll tell you a funny story about Brewdog they used to have a, a festival every single year and I did security at it once and then um, we were employed in as private so it was a little bit you kind of it wasn't I think they had um, a local company it was up north it was actually at the owner's house and uh, so it was you know but she's got a huge bar and it's his, his house is mental. The, there's two owners. There's a younger guy, but it was the older guy with glasses that he's the one, I can't remember his name, but he's the one I met. So I was standing at one of the gates. It was next to his house and his cars were behind me and stuff like that. And he was like, I got told under no circumstances, do you let anybody in this house? No matter if they say it's wife, son, anybody, kids, doesn't uncle, doesn't matter, you don't let in. So then the owner, well, co-founder of Brewdog walks up and is sitting and is like, you know, I need to get into my house. Like, I don't, because I didn't know who he was. I was like, I can't let you in. I don't know who you are. He's like, you're joking, right? In other words, he said, you're joking, right? And I was like, no, 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 I can't. I genuinely can't let you in. So then he walks away and then uh, my manager comes over and he'd be like, you do know this gentleman actually is the co-founder of Brewdog. And I was like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. So I kind of, I was like, okay, I need to get moved positions. So I like walked away and then he came back with a creative brew dog and stuff and was like, look, I appreciate what you've done because you don't actually know who I, you, I was like, I didn't know you know who I was. I was like, no, I studied your event. I know the map. I know the car park. I know where everybody's parking. I know where everybody is. I know where the fires are going to be and all this sort of stuff. But I didn't have time to study you as a person. Yeah. It's, it's cool as I appreciate it. But he was like, to be honest Aww. with you, the fact that you, if you told me, if you let me through and be like, I don't actually know who you are, I probably would have sacked you there yeah he probably would have told you to leave so yeah but yeah this this, yeah it's a weird story but I think that um that's admirable as well and the fact that they they started off 10 there was a thing on um, LinkedIn 
they started off 10 grand or something like that. And then a 20 grand loan, or was it 30 grand and a 20 grand loan? There was one of them. They started off with an X amount of money and then just turned up and now they've you know, it's a multi-million pound company easily. Yeah, yeah. But, so who knows what the future holds? Yeah, that's what's the way to say. Is, is there like a, have you ever had that thought when you were younger? Because a lot of people in media I found personally, because I've actually spoken to um, <laughs> Alan Davison and Rick Lawrence, who work, who actually know you very, who know you personally as well. Wait, and, who was the second one? Uh, Rick Lawrence. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. He's he's and Alan's like, Alan's Alan's really funny, such a cheery, lovely guy, and uh, it seems that Bauer hires good people. I don't know, and I don't work for Bauer, and I'm not saying I'm ever going to, but it generally does. Everybody I've spoken to for Bauer seems to be like driven, and they all have that kind of same common sense goal. But have you? Has there ever been like? Um, a time where you you were obviously upset about the you know wanting to work for you know in media and stuff like that but there was there ever a time where you were for example worked at Domino's or worked at my favorite place Blair Drum and Savoy Park where you were like you know what I might actually just stay here because a lot of uni students I've, I've got a lot of my friends and that they're like you know what I'm instead of going to go to uni next year I'm just going to drop out and I'm just going to stay at this job because I really like it did you ever have that or were you like no I need to stick to this you know stick to my degree and keep passing it and stuff yeah no I never thought I'd stay in my student jobs mm. and that's nothing against them they were awesome when I was there um I loved working in a bar um you know sometimes when I'd be having really stressful days at my work I go god I wish I worked in a bar again because you don't take your work home with you when you work in places like that you just finish your day count your tips head home and then do whatever your students do you know watch tv with your friends or go on nights out so mm. Yeah, I never thought I would stay there. They were always student jobs for me. Um, but I met some of the best people there and I'm you know, still friends with loads of them now. And I think they, they also taught me a lot as well. You know, I think everybody at some point in their life needs to do customer facing retail work because 100%, yeah. it teaches you a lot of patience mm. and manners and respect and just skills that you can tell people who haven't worked in retail, you know, you see all these stories and you're like well clearly they haven't gone through their shift of working with the public so mm. I loved what they taught me but they weren't for me mm. yeah I think that even with being in the doors myself from 18 till well before Covid obviously but technically during it as well kind of just because the way things worked out um, I think it, you, you can you really it does it gives you an appreciation when you go into a bar because it's the bars and clubs bars was clubs was my main you know the story I told you about that you know will stay personal between us and that that was a club thing but then bars you can it then when you go out when I go out myself even though I don't drink I still I still go out to party and stuff because I just don't drink or take anything or nothing like that but I think it's a it does it does it does give you like a a, a it's, it's, it's like a weird appreciation when you walk in and you're always like please and thank you and stuff and people kind of look yeah. at you be like it's like yeah but I've worked in this I know what it's like after like the 10th hour you're like I just want to go home to my bed and two hours you know you've got a 12 hour shift or I know quite a few people that work 13 hour shifts in bars and I'm like I couldn't even imagine doing that I only work eight hours I, and it was it was mental but I think that um Something I'm curious about yourself, and I think this is a good time to ask, and it's a very off question. Now, I never ever tell people I'm going to ask this question because I'm like, I really want to, I really surprise people. But what's what's your biggest flaw professionally and personally? Oh, Jesus, that's deep. Um, <laughs> um, I, oh, oh, God, that's opening a can of worms, isn't it? Um, professionally. No, I can do personal easier. I yeah, think fine. personally, I don't say no. To be honest, this is probably professional as well. I don't say no easily. So I will quite happily pile all this work onto myself. I'll pile all people's plans and emotions and issues. And it ends up being more detrimental to me than helpful to other people. And if I'm not flying my best flag then who does that help it helps no one so I think it's the same flaw for both you know I'll I'm just learning that was something my fiance said to me he was like you have to turn away work if you get too busy remember so 
you know, I've just started to learn to be like, no, I don't have availability for that. And the dates you want, you'll have to either find another video producer or take a date that is available. Mm. So I am the same personally, you know, I won't say no to plans. I feel bad if I let people down. And yeah, I think those are probably the most pressing issues Mm. in both of those areas. I am. Um, I, uh, I, I, you know, developed a flaw and you probably know what I'm going to say here with what we talked about, but obviously again, it's a, and everyone in the podcast is like, there's certain people that do know about it and I appreciate the love in that, but there does come a time at where there was like, I don't feel like I should be pouring too much personal life on, you know, podcasts and stuff like that because I've done it before. But my, my flaw is I don't know when to let go. Yeah. And you'll know what I'm referencing here. And a lot of people will know, and because I have spoken to about, um, to a lot of different people recently and they they know about it and you know people I keep relating back to the gym which is frustrating but it's because I spend a lot of my time there helping people like helping people lose weight motivating people and I'm not qualified I just generally love love doing that sort of stuff for free but it's when to let go is my biggest flaw like because I've I then use the what I call is the what if factor and I'm curious to see yourself as well the what if factor for those of you who don't Everybody should know it, but those of you who don't know it, the what if factor is where you're, you 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 want to let go of something, but you're like, or even leave your job, or people have actually, um, and a big shout out to a certain, uh, maybe a group of people. They maybe, I think there's maybe five or six, and there'll be six of them now actually, um, but that have actually helped put in positions where they're like, I never actually realised what the what if factor was until, and it made. It has made people question, as you saying, as you were saying about the divorce rate and that and the relationships, and they have moved on from that type of thing. But the what if factor is something that I've kind of had to teach myself as in like, if you're questioning the what if factor too much, like over and over and over and over again, you probably don't want to do it. So I want to ask yourself, have you ever used the what if factor on whether it be work professionally, you know, relationship wise, just anything? Have you ever used it? And if you used it, did you use it for... um? you know, what if, you know, this person goes or what if I don't take this down versus, you know, the other one, have you ever used it for that? I mean, the whole freelancing decision would be what if, like, what Mm. if I don't get any clients? What if no one wants to hire me? What if I leave and the grass is actually greener on the side I was on? You know, the the whole process of that has been what if. So my, my life for the past three months has been what ifs. Um, hopefully I've made the right decision and I've not regretted anything yet but yeah I would say to actually make this decision would have been a what if factor yeah how do you um and I think it was a good what if factor to be honest with you because I always say to people that if you're that proud and like I know a lot of um a lot of my friends are electricians and well people I know are electricians and plumbers and they've they've done the same thing it's like they work for somebody and then they've been like as you can imagine, they've like left and now they're actually really successful. Some of them not so much and had to go back to their jobs, but some of them have actually been like really, really proper successful. And I said to them, I was like, it's the same thing. It's like, okay, you can go and try it. And like what you said about transferable skills. And if it doesn't work out, you can just be like, I tried, if you go and say to a company, I tried to go out on my own, but it didn't work. They're going to be like, they probably admire you more versus somebody. But a, a question that I, I, I actually get asked this a lot um, when it comes to media again um, is that a lot of people tell me that and uh, a lot of people tell the other direction but that you don't the degree how to explain this question the first one I ever asked it was actually um, one of your old colleagues Alan was it and we talked about it and he and I was like what I was told by my lecturers is you can have the, the best degree you know I think it's like a one one or something like that or whatever it is you can have that and you can be amazing but if you have no presence online and you're doing absolutely nothing online, companies will turn around and say, why haven't you been doing anything online? Like what's colleges, you know, or uni, sorry, college, uni, it's a three year thing I'm doing. So it's like two days a week, there's seven days in a week, you know, what have you doing? So would you say you still need that bit of media online or even like to have a following versus just having a degree? Yes, absolutely. I don't even think you need a degree um it's nice and I love my uni experience um made beautiful friends met my partner but I don't think it's the be be all and end all of getting into the job in this industry you know I think there's 
there's industries that you need it in like being a doctor and things but in terms of media I think there's so many different routes in there's so many different avenues that you can take to get your you know step and foot in the door um so yeah I, I feel like I know people who have been turned down for freelancing jobs because a client's not liked the style of their Instagram or there's been people who are like well why are you not updating what you're doing and things so I think social media and online presence is massive no matter what job that you're really in because a lot of people look for your presence and and how you work with people how you react what your style is and that's what can get you jobs that's what can get your foot in the door so yeah it's huge it's a huge thing yeah I think that it comes I actually know some of it without naming names again again even though they will know who they are because they do watch this and I was speaking to them tonight um a lot of them turned in and said it's the same thing with them like when they've been personal trainers and gyms where they've worked a lot of them worked down south and they moved up here just because of like um their partners well one of them their pres partner stays up here and then she ended up getting pregnant so he moved his whole life up here but he's really successful now and been a personal trainer but I always said to him I was like what made you made that change and he was like to be honest with you when I started when I was starting being a personal trainer I had nothing on social media just me and my mates going out and everybody was like that makes no sense like mm -hmm. why would I come personal train with you so then he completely transformed his life around, got in shape, and now he's blown up on Instagram because, and which is actually, that's how he got his job up here because the company up here, he was like, they were like, look, we're actually looking for people because we've seen your plan of moving to Scotland. He put a post up, he's like, do you want to come work for us? Work alongside us, I should say. Because I think, he, you know, they pay so much a month to get the gym membership for free. So he was like, yeah, that's yeah. that's perfectly fine. So I mean, but it, it, it is, I think it's the whole, um, like my mom says the same thing. She's like, you need a degree. You know, but she's like, if you don't want to do it, if you don't want to do it on a certain subject, that's fine. But degrees help you so much. And I'm like, well, yes and no, arguably. I know a lot of successful people in business. And uh, I always give a shout out to my mate, Danny, who owns um, Vehicles and Videos, it's an app where if you're going to buy a car, you know, because you're in Edinburgh saying there was a car in London, instead of you going all the way down to London, the people will get them to download an app, use his app, and then you'll download it as well. And they'll send you it. He's kind of developed that and it's been really yeah. successful. Yeah, and he said, you know, I hear all these people about going to business. And he was like, the people that work for me have been to like business. And he's, it's not that big, but the people he's had to hire people. And he's like, I know nothing about business, but I learned it all myself. And I think what you're right saying is a degree is really, really good. And I'd never tell anybody not to get one. But there is certain jobs out there that you genuinely do not need to go to college for. Like, and a lot of people, I think that a lot of people get caught into the spiral of, SAS pays you every single month it pays your bills it pays I think it pays half your rent or something like that or whatever it's chunked towards your rent and stuff and I think that's like a a spiral that once you're in it does swallow people up like I know somebody that's been at college for 10 years which is crazy to think about but he's like but I feel so secure I've learned all these different subjects I'm like but where are you going to go with this type of stuff yeah it, it is a shame but now, jumping on from the social media thing, I think that um, and I'm curious to ask yourself this. Would you say that you have to watch what you post on social media in a sense of, because um, I might have said that to somebody and took it the wrong way. And I was like, no, 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 I don't mean nothing like that. I mean, like, with versus like for somebody that's going for a job and has um, is posting pictures of them getting drunk all the time or constantly out versus somebody that kind of keeps reserve on that stuff and it's like keeps it off social media would you say companies will necessarily turn down him even or that person even though he's highly qualified versus someone that has a clean social media and would you say companies will or do look at your social media yeah i'd say so um i think if i was hiring someone i'd have a look at their social media just to see what they're doing what they're saying how they're talking to people um and it is it's even if it's not you know, they always say Instagram versus reality is mm. still a reflection on you. Um, mm. You know, and you can, the, the good and bad thing about it is that you can control what people see. Um, so, you know, you could be a massive party animal and not post about it and the company would know none the wiser. Mm. But I think it's, always good to sort of portray especially if you're going for things you know if you're a doctor or a lawyer or trying to get into a certain brand I know like innocent smoothies look at your social media and they see kind of 
what your tone is, how you interact with people and stuff. So they look at that as part of your sort of application, I'm sure. Mm. So I think it's important to portray what you want people to see. But then there's also the argument to be real as well. Um, and, you know, not just showing this perfect life. So I think there's a fine balance between what you want people to see and what people should be seeing. So, yeah, I think it's each to their own. And, you know, if you're going to do crazy party things or inappropriate posts and make your profile private because companies will probably look at them. I know I would. Mm, yeah, that comes down to as well is because I knew somebody um, and I kind of I wish I could shout his name out, but I know he would go absolutely mental. But even though it's all sorted now and it's done and dusted, but he was huge online for posting his um his body and stuff like that, as in the sense of like wanting to be an Instagram model. So I mean, the guy is in you know eight pack beyond eight pack. He's one someone that motivates me to go to the gym. He's in you know incredible, a really good looking guy. But he was he started being like really arrogant. If somebody commented on him, but you look really good, he was like obviously. And I was like, you could lift that. Well, obviously I can't. And then the company actually caught wind and he got suspended for it. And then he actually tried to yeah. sue the company. But yeah, but the company turned around and said, look, you're employed by us. I can't say the job type or this would make so much sense. But it was customer service based kind of. But um, so it, it does make a lot of sense. And they were like, the fact that you're being like that, we don't actually see what you're like with our customers. And it yeah. wasn't retail based, but it was customer service based. So like, we don't see what you're like with our customers because of what you post on social media. So he he wiped his whole social media and kept the same name, but wiped everything and started completely again. I was like, I'm really sorry. And it transformed him around. But when I tell people that now and I tell people that story, they're like, yeah, but that won't happen with me. And I'm like, but it will happen with you. Like they will look at your social media. And when what you were saying about making it private, <clears throat> I've spoken to companies um, personally about some personal stuff and you know figuring out what they actually look for in people and just being like, I don't want a job or that. I just want to know how you judge social media and stuff. So we've had conversations and they've had that if you make your Instagram private, we will have an account and or whether it be the manager or the personal, and we will follow your Instagram because we want to see what you post versus that. Yeah. And if, if it's private and you're not willing to let us see, it means you're hiding something. So we will probably not hire you. It does. It's, yeah, yeah. yeah it, 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 it's, it's crazy. And a lot of people think it doesn't apply to stuff, but it applies to anything from if you're working in a trade because you, you, I know a lot of people that work in trade that have to have their Instagrams on public just in case they post anything that's completely way out there or they say something or, and there was that debate about, I can't remember the, the, the um, woman that got sacked from something because she posted something. It wasn't something like completely out there, but it was something on social media on Twitter. She replied back to a comment. I can't remember who it was. It was something to do with Asda. What was it? Oh, it was, it was, I think it was that she was like, her shift was too long. She couldn't be bothered working at Asda anymore. All she wanted to do home. And Asda tweeted back and she's, cause and they, they must've been following her or something like that, but they tweeted back and it's like, we're fine. We've just, they said her full name and they said her line manager's name. Like we've just got in contact with them. Don't worry. You're not coming in tomorrow. That's you done. And she actually lost her job and she tried to sue them. But at the end of the day, Asda's were like, well, you're, you're talking, you know, rubbish about our company so yeah. you, we're not going to have you working for us and she lost her job and it that was that was that hit a lot of home that hit home for a lot of people but yeah and especially with um how much they want especially with a certain website just now you probably know what i mean you probably know what i mean without me saying any more than that i think people need to watch what they're putting online yeah. my 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 opinion there's certain things that are out there that just now i'm like that has to hurt you in like 10 years time or something but again yeah. each, I've never tell anybody what to do I'd only give if they ask me for my advice I'm one well, type of person like for example if you ever ask me you know in the future just like can I get you like say I'm working on something like can I get your advice I'd, get, I'd more than happily give you but I always say to people be like you don't actually have to take it you don't have yeah. to you don't, don't yeah. you don't have to do actions on it but my advice is stop this or stop that or doing this because companies will and companies have but then I am the type of person that can like um admit when he's wrong and learn from lessons so I think that's that's something I've had to learn as well but now I think time is something that I really value and um time is something that uh again I'm jumping between questions here but it's just because you, you know you really like I'm really interested in yourself and how you actually you know going back and forth and I keep thinking of questions and things like that but value and time is something that I value um 
really highly. And before I say how I value time, I'm curious to yourself, how do you value time with having like, obviously, well, I know myself with having a dog, it's a huge, 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 way more commitment than I thought it was. But having dogs and plus, you know, you've got a fiance, plus you've got work and bills. And how do you value your time? I feel like I did a lot of things like I, I just pack my diary all the time I do and I kind of you know COVID again made me think I want to do more of what I want what I want to do so my mum and dad live a few hours away from me so I want to see them more I've got nephews I want to hang out with them I you know want to go on holidays and want to walk the dog and I just felt like being kind of tied down to a nine to five you're working for someone else's clock you're on your computer first thing in the morning and you're on last thing at night you're checking your emails on your phone I just thought that is too time consuming for me um and I'm not really getting to do the things that I want to do and life's too short to not do what you want to do especially when you're sort of the age that I feel I'm at where I've not really got a lot of commitment in terms of I've not got kids or anything so yeah I think that was kind of a turning point for me in terms of I will get more of my time back so I value it massively you know it's you know you're you only get one life so mm. use your time wisely I would say yeah 100 percent. I am the reason I like getting people's answers first because my answer it, I mean it sometimes shocks people I might it might not but it sometimes does is that and it's why a certain situation um um, bugs me more than anything else it's not because of the thing and I referenced back to it in a, a previous podcast actually with uh, Miss Tara Baker and we talked about it and I did get some people um, speaking to me but I've, I've mentioned it before with my Danny Sammy podcast and some people mentioned me like what are you talking about in that podcast are you able to talk about it and I was able to talk about it through DMs and people were like wow like so that's 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 crazy but I think that the fact that something that annoys me is I value every second everybody gives me. So obviously the fact that you've given me all you, I'm not ending the podcast, I'm just in general saying, the fact that you've given me your time means a lot. I mean, I walk into um, the co-op just down, literally just down the road from me. And uh, as I stay near Perth, is about what I want to say online, is uh, near Perth. So the co-op just literally just a couple minute walk from me. And uh, even when I'm standing having a conversation with the person behind there, that means loads because that's like five minutes or however long that they can't ever take back. So I always say to people, like, if somebody's willing to give you a second, even if they say no, that's still amazing. Because again, people, you know, have said yes to coming on the, the podcast like yourself and people have said no. And I'm always like, they're always like, you know, no, sorry, I'm really sorry. I'm like, no, no, don't be sorry. The fact that you took the initiative to message me back means mm -hmm. people that didn't. And it, it, it's, I think it's a, every second somebody's willing to give me means so much because again, at the end of the day, it's not as if you can like, take that time back when you go home or nothing like that because everybody has 24 hours in a day and yeah. I think that yeah. I think that the, the people that process the, the the fact of I have 24 hours in a day how can I improve is there anything you would say like for well maybe not necessarily today because you're working on your brother's stuff but is there anything like you if you have the 24 hours you're like how do I comment how do I um use 24 hours wisely versus you know not using it as wisely as what people might, you know, nor pe most people normally do, I could say. Oh, I wish I could be, like, I'm quite an early riser, but I'm a faffer at the start of the day. So I get up early, but I faff around. So I feel like I could be more productive in the morning. So that's something I always think, like, I could go and work out or do some yoga or take the dog for a really early, she's a lazy bone soul, but I could, mm. I feel like I could use my mornings a bit better than I do. Um, so I think in my 24 hours, the start of it's probably wasted, but I am much more, the fact I get up early doesn't mean that I'm productive early. I am much more productive after like three o'clock in the afternoon when I'm a bit more coffeeed up and settled in. And yeah, I think if I could adapt my 24 hours, I'd maybe move it up a little bit and chill out a bit more in the evenings. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, uh... It's a hard one because people say the same with myself. Like when I'm doing uni work, I always like, I'm sitting in class and the teacher's like, yeah, you're going to do it now. And I'm like, probably not. Like I, I just, I'm always open. Yeah, I'm always like, I'll do it after college and or uni, well, depends what side, if I'm doing the uni work or if I'm doing the college side, 
I, I'm always like, yeah, I'll do it then. Or they're like, for example, a mine is Monday, Wednesday. So I'm like, they're like, oh, so we'll know you'll do it on the Tuesday. And I'm probably, probably, or the Saturday, Sunday. It's more like when I feel I can be productive. But I'm the type of person that will, you know, turn off my phone as much as I can if I'm not doing anything, you know, for the podcast, that then I can turn off my phone and fully focus on it and turn it back on again. But something that I've had to deal with um, a little, I, well, not with this podcast, with some stuff I've done before that's no longer up because I, I, I couldn't deal with the, the negativity stuff. So unfortunately, I had to get rid of that channel, which was a little bit frustrating and annoying, but I couldn't, I didn't learn how to deal with it. But how, how do you deal with negativity? And if you do deal with it really well, how did you learn to deal with it? Oh, I can't help in this. I deal with it terribly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I remember posting up uh, so my first ever vlog with my dog um, I had people like people are so opinionated and mm. I honestly get so frustrated by it because I'm like why bother like why are you commenting on my stuff like just don't mm. you know I remember I posted up a, at the start of lockdown I couldn't go on travel adventures to vlog so I started just making food dishes from places I'd been and people were like, she can't hold a knife properly or I'm not going to take advice from someone who cuts onions like that. And I was like, oh my God, why are you bothering? Like, what? And so I get a bit like that. Like I get a bit frustrated being like, you know, there's lovely comments and I'm like, they're nice, but that person is, <laughs> and, and I focus on them. So yeah. it's something I'm learning every day and it's something I need to get better at, definitely. Um, but part of me is also like, why don't they just be quiet? like I I just don't see the need to you know maybe if I'm not holding a knife like a professional chef then fine I'm not but there's no need like I've had so many friends because I I know a lot of radio people and one of the presenters I know she just posted up a video of her and her her boyfriend you know hanging out at home and somebody said yeah you've definitely got a bit more of a stomach on you now like what's the need like what's the need that's not doing nothing but causing a bit of sadness in her life and why bother so I wish I could help with the negativity, but it's something I am so massively learning. But as soon as I know, I will let you all know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's ever since I went, um, because I've never really had, it's a weird, I've always had like a, when Instagram kind of, when I was first getting into it, I tried I tried to post Call of Duty videos. I was one of those guys, which a lot of people will definitely know. And I, I was, you know, I did, because I did it kind of like, semi-competitively like I never made any money but there was tournaments we entered in, as you do in after school as a child and that and then I started posting and my last one was about motivation and things like that so I didn't have social media for about five years and then when I got back to it um last year roughly at this time I started posting uh, motivational stuff and then I got rid of it but when I started posting gym stuff it's crazy how like people are like well be like oh you shouldn't you shouldn't you know how can you do this and how can you do that? And then you go on their Instagram and then there's nothing there or they're like posting completely irrelevant stuff to that, but they yeah. feel like they need it. But would you say that um, that is a kind of like, you know, and you know, when you, what, you know, the, the saying about um, don't read a book by its cover type thing, uh, would you say it's that kind of thing? And if, if so, would, have you ever had, have you ever dealt with that where somebody's maybe been off one day, but then the next day they've been like, sorry, I was off and this type of reason. Yeah, like, you know, you deal with that at work all the time and someone speaks to you in a bad way or, you know, somebody takes something you've said or feedback you've given in a bad way and then they've come back and, you know, some people don't admit it and it's, that's frustrating. But if you have the decency to put your hands up and be like, look, I was just having a really off day, then it's much more admirable than if they just act like that all the time um yeah I've dealt with a lot of people and I think that's something that I've been taught in my career is how to kind of put yourself in other people's shoes and go okay well they're having an off day just reset tomorrow we'll we'll try again so everybody has days like that and everybody has days where you sort of think at the end of the night being like oh I shouldn't have said that like that or I've maybe hurt that person and I think it's owning up to it and accepting that you are everyone's flawed so yeah I've dealt with a lot of that yeah I think that um 
dealing dealing with that was deal, dealing with it the way I did it was I actually opened up to somebody I personally look up to as my mum considering when she was grown up she couldn't afford milk well her mum obviously couldn't afford milk mm -hmm. and she had to like then develop a career and push forward so my mum's always kind of been like she still is my best friend and she's always been my idol versus my famous kind of person I don't really necessarily have a famous type of person I literally look up to. The reason being is because it's kind of switched over the years. When I was really, really young, um, you know, the the bachelor type people like, you know, Charlie Sheen and Aston Kutcher, all those type of people, the, the natural people that guys look up to when they really shouldn't, but they do. But um, who, who's, who would you say that you look up to where it be like, non-celebrity as i always say that cause it's easier to define it even though obviously like i say my mom's a celebrity in my eyes but mm -hmm. you know that type of thing who would you say you don't you that you not look that you, that you looked up to as a non-celebrity versus maybe a celebrity mm -hmm. or somebody in a higher position yeah i mean i think i've always been celebrity wise i love holly willoughby i think she's mm -hmm. lovely and so good at her job and hilarious um so she's someone who, in, in Fair and Cotton as well, you know, I feel like they come as a bit of a pair. They're lovely idols and they're very good idols, I would say. Um, in terms of non-celebrities, you know, I'm the same. My mum, family members, my granny was amazing. Um, I think she's a huge part of how much of a strong woman I am. Um, and she's created a whole generation of strong, independent women in our family, um, stubbornly so. <laughs> and yeah, I would say sort of the woman in my life. Um, my dad is awesome as well. Um, and my brother, my brother's been through some stuff and, and he's oh, yeah. come out stronger and he's such a good dad to his little boys. And yeah, family members are massive to look up to, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I think it's a, uh, you know, having that. I mean, I always look up, even though we don't, you know, necessarily speak as much. But I still look up to my little sister, how she moved out way before I did, way before I. I'm going to personally, due to certain personal circumstances, she managed to move out when she was 17, 18, 18, 17. No, it was eighteen because she worked in a bar, and then she was working at a bar and worked with uni, and then she went through or seventeen, sorry, and then she went through complete uni and pay for her rent and and it all but she never worked in student halls it's always been her own actual place so that I look up to her big time on that type of stuff but me and her have spoken before about like I was like what's like what do you fear like what's your kind of fears and she was I won't say obviously but she said certain things and I'm like wow that's I never looked at it like that but my one of my biggest fears I personally say is like missing out so I always have a theory that I'm going to miss out on something. Yeah, yeah, it's that everybody has that thing. Like, <laughs> I better not go to sleep just now because if I don't go out, I'm going to miss out on this event or stuff like that. But, and I deal with it by, well, I don't deal with it. I always like sacrifice sleep or sacrifice college or sacrifice, you know, uni or work or anything or the gym for, you know, the whole, you know, uh, facing my fears type thing. But have you ever had to like face your fears and if you have how did you deal with it or if you didn't deal with it how did you how did you learn how you could deal with it if that makes sense I don't know if I ever have had to do anything that I've thought that is terrifying traveling was scary um and I kept getting butterflies and and being really nervous about it but like I say I'm quite go with the flow deal with it as it comes kind of personality so I don't think I can actually pinpoint one time I've had to deal with fears you know my my fears are like spiders and, <laughs> and things like that um but I think I think facing your fears is also coming underneath the coming out your comfort zone um and it helps you grow and you know there's all that talk about how facing your fears is the way you overcome your fears mm. so I definitely think it is a way to grow and a way to challenge yourself and something you probably should do in your career and in your personal life all the time yeah I think it, I think it, and a lot of people I've spoken to people before after certain podcasts asking people that question and like you know that actually helped me a lot because I struggle to face my fears and 
some people have asked me, why do you ask people on career driven, career driven people, why fears? And I'm like, well, the reason is, is because most people that are in a career driven actually are able, if they're not able to identify their fear, they're able to realize that they feel uncomfortable. So they put themselves in uncomfortable positions to be able to like be up there. And obviously people can like really relate to that without necessarily like showing they relate to that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, um, the, the fear is something that because his face I mind out I met a guy um Owen was his name he worked for he worked for Anglian Windows and then he worked for Pennycook Windows and then he worked for Weather Seal but he was like the, my first ever um this man and um, pulled up in a really really nice convertible walked out with had a 500 pound pen wearing the Rolex the gold chain I mean this guy was like the first ever millionaire I'd actually ever seen and it was him that told me he was like what's your fear about What's your fear in life in general? Mine used to be confidence, which clearly isn't the thing anymore. And then we, we had a conversation and he, he said the same thing, that it, fear just means face everything and rise. It's not a real emotion or nothing like that. It's more a being afraid is an emotion. Fear isn't, but which is really debatable because I've said that before and people have caught like DM'd me or anything like that. I've been like, that makes no sense because it is an emotion, but it's not and it is. It's, it's, it's a different one. But what I do want to say is, um, you know, Again, I really do appreciate you coming uh, on the podcast and things like that. It means a lot as well. The fact that even though we talked about uh, kind of like, you know, yourself being self-employed and that and it, the fact that you're only three months in, but you're still, because a lot of people necessarily would do that, would be like after a week, they're like, oh God, uh, I think I've made the wrong move here. And on the phone to their old boss, they'd be like, can I get my job back? But what would you say is your goal? I think it's a good, really good question to necessarily end on what would you say is your goal for being um not five years because that's not that's I don't I just personally don't believe five year goal is easily attainable I think a 10 year goal is more because that way you're able to put in uh, 10 steps not necessarily because it's 10 years but and over accomplish the steps but where would you say you want to be in 10 years oh I I'm a huge family person, so I'd love to have a family. Um, I'd love to be able to work around my family, which is massive, again, on time. Mm -hmm. And being flexible around them and really moulding my career and my contributions to the household around family. Um, I really would have liked to progress my presenting skills a bit and my on-camera skills. Um, And, yeah, to be honest... I need to actually sit down and work out my goals because I don't, I never, I've never been one for doing that again. Like I say, I'm, I'm very go with the flow. So wherever life sort of takes me is where I'm quite happy to be. So I think in terms of life, I'm enjoying the flexibility at the moment and I'm hoping that that just continues. Um, but in terms of my career, I am all open to wherever it takes me. Mm. Good, good. And I think that's, again, I think having that tenure, I always say to people, they're like, why do you always ask people, as you're saying about negativity and people's opinions and that, they always say, why do you always ask 10 years? And I always say, because five years ago, I was still in the position I'm in today. But in Mm -hmm. five years time, there's no chance that I will be in that position, not with where I want to go. And my, my, my thing is, it's only fair to comment on that. My thing is to be, blow this up, to be able to help people and be able to turn um, in Kyle's convo into a charity and then so that I can then hook people up and like be a mentor like be a mentor charity I can hook people up the, the slang way of putting it is put people in positions where you know you know for example say you do have the your own company but like, I actually know Fiona she's hiring people you've just done this degree you've done this I'll put you I'll ask her nicely if I can put you in contact the same with I said the same with Alan or even like if I knew anybody that was like in a recruitment role at Bauer, I'd be like, look, I actually know this person and I could put you in this position, but not for money type stuff, just because the the podcast would pay the bills and pay all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. But being able to put people into positions, that's where I want to be. But whether it be in this country or the plan right now is to move to the States next June. Oh. So yeah, move to Texas um, wow. next June. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, I've never ever been, but I, I, I love riding horses and various other subjects, driving cars relatively fast and stuff. So I was like, why not just go to Texas where everything is like huge compared to, you know, over here, you yeah. know? 
Absolutely. And I'm lucky enough, yeah, I'm lucky enough not to have minus my dog, but I always talk to my mum really nicely when she gets a new place to take my take the animals in for me. But yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Do it. Do it. But, yeah, well, I, again, I do want to, um, before I say what I was going to say there, I want to shout out your, um, I want, well, obviously yourself, so I, Dex, I've got things wrong before in this, but I want to um, ask yourself, what is your YouTube channel, and if you have an Insta, if you have an Instagram or Twitter you want to shout out, what is your Instagram and Twitter? My, so my work one is Fiona Jane Creative, um, I'm just still building it, um, and my personal youtube where i put all my vlogs and stuff is you can just search fiona jane and it's a nice picture of me and my doggy <laughs> so they are the ones that i am definitely up for promoting and telling people about yeah yeah and what i'll do is um just because i'm not very good at getting people i'm not very good at copying it down so i'll get you to send me them and then everybody will be able to check in the bio and that but Perfect. i think you you personally are going to make motivate a lot of people to maybe like jump into this step because a lot of people that I've spoken to work for companies but you actually went self-employed so but the the last question I want to ask um before I say a certain thing is that I, if there was somebody watching this right now that was worried about maybe saying they were in a nine to, like a normal nine to five job whether that be working in you know a shop or maybe as a lifeguard or in the gym or just anything general mm -hmm. what would you say to them if they were going to like wanting to go self-employed for like a dream or even if they want to join do go do their dream job what would you say to them it's scary but if you take the right steps and believe in your skills then do it you know what's what's the harm just go and try it and if it's not for you then there'll be something else out there what's for you won't go by you 100 percent, yeah and i always tell people that if somebody tells you no for a job or anything like that okay there's like hundreds of other companies out there like somebody will tell you that like you, you can only get so many no's before you get a yes it's yeah. that type of thing and I always that's what I managed to get into my positions and my jobs and stuff like that is that I got rejected a lot but then I contacted a company and I was like look I don't know if you're hiring for people like I have no idea and it turns out they actually weren't hiring anybody but I managed to talk myself into a job because they were like we actually like the fact you took the initiative to ask us rather than just being like I'm going to wait for a job but I I want to push people towards kind of like influence people a little bit to doing that but again I, I do want to say a huge thank you for your time oh, I mean thank you for having me it's all good it means it means it's it's my pleasure honestly and it is I, I think it's that you know because I think it's because I value people's time so much and you know especially when they have things to do like you have you maybe have stuff to work on but you know you have your dog your fiance you have all these other things but you still manage to dedicate and I think it's over an hour I don't know but however mm -hmm. long it is you uh, we managed to get you know a, a conversation in that's going to help influence people and motivate people you know what I mean definitely yeah. But, yeah and I want to tell everybody because I never ever say this because it's not something I'm because I do this to help people and everybody will know what I'm going to say I never ever tell people to subscribe ever but that's because <laughs> I tell people just took from what you know from what I speak to you said but everybody like like comment subscribe it means a lot like the comments are getting again I love criticism because it makes me improve as a person. So if you want to criticize me, comment or DM me on Instagram or tweet me, or if you want to do it on my personal Instagram, anything you want, just improve, improve, improve. Because I think that's something everybody, especially now that you know we're coming out of a pandemic, I think that's something that everybody's tried to do. And I think everybody should constantly try and improve every single day. 1% a week, 1% every three days, and then 1% every single day. But that's what I want to say on that one. And thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you all there.